Um, yeah, so um, my new book, which was uh, just published two days ago, um, is called Stealth of Nations. And I couldn't believe that uh, in 235 years after Adam Smith published his book, no one had taken that title, um, which is probably why I sold the book in the first place. Um, so at any rate, this was uh, one of my possible titles before I thought of uh, Stealth of Nations. And basically what I'm trying to do here, and it's great uh, to speak after such an inspiring talk, because um, of course, reframing doesn't mean that every frame's correct and every frame is going to make that utopia. We're always in search of utopia. And so what I'm trying to do here with the reframing is expand the frame, and as Andrew said, to look at something that is normally not looked at by uh, the economic powers that be. So basically what my whole talk can be summarized in two slides, and it depends what you think of these two slides. This is Oshodi Market in Lagos, Nigeria in 2007. And it's an image I took that I think of as, I think of Oshodi at that period of time as an Aleph. Jorge Luis Borges wrote the short story, The Aleph. And The Aleph is a point in the world where absolutely everything exists. And Oshodi was a point in the world where absolutely everything exists. It's total commercial cacophony. The traffic there is actually moving, albeit very slowly. And um, people are just selling every kind of product, and it had its own sound. It was the combination of the massed murmurings of thousands and thousands of people. Um, it was just an amazing place. And two years later, this is what Oshodi looks like. Um, it's the opposite of the Aleph. It's the point in the world where absolutely nothing exists. Um, and it really depends, everything about my talk depends on whether you think the second image, which is saner, is uh, better for the economy and the people of Nigeria than the first image. Um, so this is Bologan Market in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm going to run you through some statistics and some photos of markets. Uh, Bologan Market in Lagos, Nigeria is a fabric market. And 80% of the working people in Nigeria are in what I've started referring to not as the informal economy, because I think that word has a bit of stigma to it, um, but rather System D, which I've pirated from the French-speaking Africa and Caribbean, where people refer to the informal economy as l'économie de la débriardise. And to be a débriard is to be self-reliant. And so this is kind of the DIY economy of the world, which I think is a less judgmental phrase than informal economy. Um, there are 1.8 billion people, half the workers of the world on the planet, who are now working off the books and in System D. And um, that number is rising. So by 2020, it'll be two thirds of the planet. Um, what does that mean for the world? Well. It means that the total value, if you compute it based on percentages of GDP, is $10 trillion. And that's an astounding figure. Because if you think about if all of the street markets and other informal businesses, and I'm not including criminality here. I'm only talking about legal products sold in the quasi-legal way. I'm not talking about drug dealing. I'm not talking about organ harvesting. I'm not talking about human slavery or anything like that. Nils will handle all that later. Um, <laughs> but um, $10 trillion is a massive amount of money. And if it was combined in a single political entity, right, call it the USSR, or Bazaristan, it would be the second largest economy in the world. Numero uno is, of course, the United States. Um, so this is an amazing thing. This is a huge entity of enterprise that's vastly important in the majority of the world. And combine that with this fact that in the next decade and a half, the majority world the cities of the majority world will create 50% of the world's economic growth. So what we're really looking at is that Bazaristan, the USSR, will probably catch the United States at some point. And depending on what happens with China and the value of the yuan, um, China may be more or maybe less, but it's hard to tell. But at any rate, it's an amazingly powerful force of enterprise for the world. So put all this together, we're in a Magritte world. 
And what does that mean concretely? It means that squatter communities, and I urge you to go back and hear my pop tech talk from five, six years ago, uh, squatter communities are growing faster than legal areas. It means that the informal economy is growing faster than the formal economy, and that rationality is now irrational. And we have to get used to it. So in my journeys around the world, I had to get used to the fact that this is a huge marketplace and an employment generator. And I learned that from Andrew Saboru, who spent 16 years in that smoke and haze scavenging on the garbage dump to turn himself into a contract scaler where he was paid by a dealer to go and weigh the stuff that his fellow scavengers were selling. And finally, three years ago, into a dealer himself. And he now works the dump buying from the people, the scavengers that he used to be one of. And he contends the future is bright. He wants to grow this business. And he's pried himself out of the slums and into a nice one-room apartment in a very nice neighborhood of town. And he sees himself as an entrepreneur. In fact, his business name when he gave me his business card. And yes, people who work at the dump have business cards in Nigeria. Um, his business name was Right Time Investments. So he's ready for anything. Um, <laughs> And this, in that new world, is a store. When your community, this is Makoko, uh, which is a lagoon-side squatter community in Lagos. When your uh, community is on the water, uh, the food and stuff has to come to you. And so this woman is a store bringing grains and things like that to people in the community. This is a global business. This is also in Makoko. That's Ogun Dairo. And she smokes fish for a living. She gets the wood from the nearby sawmill. And I asked her. Where's the fish come from? And I wasn't prepared for the answer because she told me it comes from Europe. So it's caught in the North Sea, trucked down to Lagos, Nigeria, where it's trucked into one of the worst slums in the city where she smokes it and it's sold on the streets uh, for pennies. Um, so global business. And this is a shopping mall. This is Kibera, the largest squatter community in Nairobi. And this is Main Street. Um, Hugely commercial, you can see there's dozens and dozens of stores, and this goes on for miles and miles through the community. So there's a tremendous amount of commercial energy involved in this. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, these are all small businesses, and they don't amount to very much. And I just wanted to point out this is the Abasa Alakaro shoe and boot and bag market in Lagos. It's under a highway overpass so that the shoes don't get wet all the time. Um, and uh, the average Lego shoe merchant has a higher profit margin than pay less shoes. Um, smaller business, higher profit margin. But you could scale it up. So it also has impacted legitimate businesses, which are figuring out that they need to do business in the system D or informal way. And what's interesting about this photo is gala sausage rolls, which are ever present in, on the streets of Lagos, but only on the streets. Gala is produced by a century-old company called UAC Foods that's traded on the Nigerian stock market and is the definition of highly formal. It owns gas stations, it owns restaurants, it owns all sorts of stuff. But this one product, Gala Sausage Rolls, it has decided it doesn't sell in stores. It only sells through hawkers on the street and has parlayed that to huge profits. Gala is you know, the ever-present go-to snack. It's like peanuts or something. Um, you just buy it everywhere. You just roll down your car window and call one of these guys over and buy a Gala. Um, and similarly, a whole industry has evolved on the back of System D. And what I'm thinking about here is the ad there. This is from 2007, so they had Obama's campaign slogan before he did. Um, this is. MTN. MTN is a global multinational mobile phone company. They're based in South Africa. They're active in uh, about two dozen countries around the world. Multi-billion dollar company, the definition of formal. And they first came into Nigeria. They wanted to get into Nigeria because Nigeria is the big dog in Africa. It actually is the largest country by population in Africa. And one in six Africans is Nigerian. And they're early adopters of mobile technology. Everyone has a mobile phone. In fact, most people, have, many people have two mobile phones or three to have simultaneous systems going at once because it's cheaper to do that. And so 
Um, MTM desperately wanted to come in. They came in with the kind of gold-plated system that they have in the UK or that we have here, monthly plans, you buy your phone from the company, and uh, it crashed and burned. No one wanted it. So they threw it all out, took a loss on it, and came back in with a new plan, which is we don't sell you the phone, we don't sell you the plan, we let you buy a SIM card from anywhere, and we sell you airtime. And that's how we make our money. And where do they sell you airtime? From little umbrella booths at the side of the road. And this one that says 25 Naira on it is an umbrella booth. They sell recharge cards. And all the recharge cards for all the mobile phones, the pay-as-you-go mobile phones, are all sold by this informal labor force. Now, that had an impact in another way. Because where do you get the mobile phone? Where do you get the handset if MTN isn't selling you the handset? And the answer to that is here. This is Guangzhou, China, and it looks very uh, nonchalant and kind of empty uh, because the real business is through the back door and upstairs. This is the Guangzhou Dashato Secondhand Mobile Trade Center, um, but in reality, they don't sell secondhand phones there at all. They sell pirated name brand mobile phones. And these guys carrying the boxes, I followed them outside, and where are they going? They're going to Eddie in Lagos, and there's his mobile phone number. Um, all of this is done with no visas, no uh, 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 customs duty. It's completely smuggled from China into Nigeria, and it's a huge business. And indeed, you know, uh, I bought a Nokia 1110 mobile phone in Nigeria, great phone, but you know, too primitive for today's kind of mobile technology. Um, but it lasted forever. It was a wonderful phone. I paid $40. You can buy it in China for 10. So the profit margin is huge if you can just figure out how to you know, sneak it back into Nigeria. Um, now, there's always been an informal economy. This is uh, 1675 in London. The population was 350,000, and 5% of the population was street peddlers. Um, so this existed for a really long time, 1902 in Hong Kong, uh, 1940s, the Maxwell Street Market in Chicago. Um, this is... Uh, Idumota in Lagos, and I love the umbrella full of bras. Um, if you have an umbrella, you can be a store. Um, and, uh, and this is the early morning market on Rua Vincicinco de Marzo in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, so it's always existed, and it's always been maligned. It's been treated as totally criminal. And indeed, there are criminal aspects of it. So in China, you can get Versace without the vowels, Joe Mani instead of Armani, and S. Gucci. Um, my favorite, I, I, I didn't have a camera to take a picture of it when, that day when I was visiting, but in the leather market, there was a store selling uh, keychains and uh, other leather items under the brand name Alicia Keys. Um, <laughs> and, you see this reflected around the world. So here, this is in Brazil. They're selling pirated designer sunglasses for th three pairs for five reais, which is about a couple of bucks. Um, and they're selling cloned cologne. And they're selling pirated DVDs. Um, these are you know, all the fake Calvins you ever wanted. This is in China. And uh, baseball caps, Yankees caps in whatever pattern you think of and even pirated evangelical CDs. Um, so yeah, there's a criminal aspect to it, a quasi-criminal aspect to it. And yet, there's also criminality in the legal economy. You know, between 2001 and 2007, there was one company that paid $1.9 billion in bribes. And that was, <laughs> look at the numbers, two bribes every day, right, worth half a million dollars each. And what company was that? It was the German electronics giant Siemens. Totally formal, totally above board, totally legit, right? So the informal economy, System D, certainly doesn't have any, hold a candle to the kind of criminality that uh, Siemens was engaged in in its totally legal businesses around the world. Um, so basically, to conclude, I want to look at what's the frame change here? 75 years ago, John Maynard Keynes wrote this, all right? The outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live in are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and income. He was right then. He's even more right now, right? Um, and my argument would be, after looking at all these informal economies and how they operate, is that we don't have to simply mime the American 
model of formality and suggest that, you know, I like this picture because, like, you know, don't go to the USA to eat. But um, <laughs> we don't have to just mimic a, a system that we've come to expect is the dominant system and the only one that has to be broadcast all over the world. Um, in fact, we can emulate the flea market. And the philosophy of the flea market, I'll just suggest a couple of things that will make it different. One is the concept of fairness, okay? And Nietzsche put it best, that in the great work of money, the shilling of the laziest man is more lucrative than that of the poor and industrious. So if we believe in the labor value of uh, money, then uh, the lazy man's money is worth more. Um, so we have to consider fairness. We have to consider that all the definitions of our economic system are developed by the people in power in the economic system. And I look at this through the philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend, who said that facts come negotiation from, from negotiation between different parties. What we think are facts are actually things that are set supposedly in stone by the powerful interests. Um, Brazilian lawyer and philosopher Roberto Mangabeira Unger pointed out that the market can be looked upon as a cooperative and I think the growth of cooperatives, and there are a lot of bottom-up cooperatives in the informal economy, are, uh, is a very positive one. And finally, um, looking at even cashless or moneyless uh, barter type uh, arrangements, which are growing in the United States, Allen Ginsberg wrote, when can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? So um, I think there's a lot of ways of adjusting the frame here to accept that we have this vast economic system that is keeping half the workers of the world alive and employed and growing, and we have to figure out a way to interact and work with it. To that end, the solution that they did in Lagos, to go back to those first two slides, by criminalizing street trading is, I think, a big mistake. I think the way forward for the majority world is to develop the informal in some way and encourage it in some way so that it grows and thrives and becomes a major source of economic development that can bring people out of poverty and into a better life. And with that, I'll end it and say thank you. <laughs>